Hi, I'm Dr. John Cavanaugh, and we are back for AJS 101 Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 5, Part 1. So, let's begin. This chapter is about the legal aspects of policing, specifically the abuse of power, due process violations, search and seizure, arrest, and information gathering by the police. Let's talk first about abuse of power. Now the police wield tremendous power and they exercise great discretion. And by discretion, I mean the ability to make choices, to do something or not do something or to do different things. Now, power and discretion are necessary tools, but create a great potential for abuse when used by unethical officers. Obviously, police have to have power. They have to have the power to detain people, stop people, arrest people, search people, use force to control people who are out of control, use force to defend themselves, use force to defend other people. And police can do this legally when they act within the confines of the law. Police must have power. They must also have the power to arrest. <clears throat> However, the police also have great discretion when to use these, how much to use, whether to use them at all, who to use them against. So this discretion, uh, when combined with power, is necessary. The police can't enforce all the laws. Sometimes an arrest, while technically the person committed a crime, uh, shouldn't be made, just in the, in the interest, as we discussed earlier, of mercy. Uh, but when you have a lot of power and discretion to use it, and especially when you're a cop who usually works unsupervised out on the street, Unethical cops can abuse this. They can harass people. They can discriminate against people. They can steal from people. Uh, they can use excessive force against people. They can bully people. So you have a lot and violate people's constitutional rights. So there's a lot of potential for abuse if the officer is unethical. So police must exercise both their power and their discretion within the law. The law dictates when they can arrest, when they can search, when they can stop, when they can question, and, 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 all, and what's legal and what's illegal. When officers do not exercise their discretion uh, and power within the law, they abuse their power, and they maybe even commit crimes themselves. If they're illegally searching people, illegally arresting people, stealing things from people, using excessive force. If a police officer uses excessive force in making an arrest, uh, that's assault, because when you use more force than is reasonably necessary, you no longer can operate under the justification for making an arrest or defending yourself. And without that justification, any harm the officer causes to the person would be an assault against that person. So the police officer would be committing a crime. <clears throat> Examples of police abuse include the Abner Louima case in New York City and the Rodney King case in Los Angeles. Now, many of you are probably too old to even remember these cases. Uh, and if you didn't live in New York, you might not, never have heard of Abner Louima. He was a black immigrant. Uh, I think he was from Haiti. Uh, and he was walking down the street in Brooklyn when two police officers mistook him for somebody who had assaulted one of the officers earlier. An hour or so earlier that evening, there was a fight outside of a social club in Brooklyn. And uh, there was a big crowd and the police were trying to control them. And all of a sudden, one person walks up to one of the officers and punches him in the face and runs away and can't be apprehended. These, that officer and his partner, like an hour or so later, are patrolling and they see Abner Louima walking down the street and they mistake him for the person who had assaulted the police officer. They arrest him, rough him up a little bit. While he was in the station house in a cell, because they also arrested him for assaulting a police officer, and mind you, he didn't do it, uh, one of the officers took him out of the cell, took him into a, uh, uh, a cleaning closet, and beat him up and, and shoved a uh, broomstick or mop handle up his rectum. Uh, needless to say, that was excessive brutality. And this all came to light, and it was a big scandal, and the officers were arrested. Uh, but that was an example of an extreme abuse of police power. Uh, the Rodney King case was also a situation where Rodney King, who was not an angel, he had an arrest record and he was apprehended, he was high on drugs. He was driving a car at excessive speeds and he wouldn't pull over for the police, led the police on a rather long high-speed chase, at times with, with speeds exceeding 100 miles an hour. 
When the officers finally caught him, and there were now a lot of officers because many car, police cars had joined the chase, they basically surrounded him. And as they were making the arrest, they were seen repeatedly uh, hitting him with nightsticks. Uh, there was a great deal of, uh, and, and amazingly, this is when video recorders uh, first came out for personal use. I think it was back in the 80s. And some person in an apartment nearby was on the balcony and had just purchased a VHS recorder and saw the lights and pointed the camera and filmed the entire event. And this film went on national TV and there was a considerable amount of disagreement over all the force. Was it necessary and legal to make the arrest? Personally, I was a police officer at the time. And the first time I saw the video was in the police break room with other officers. And we were pretty much unanimous in saying those crop, those cops are screwed. Uh, they were caught on tape using obviously excessive force. However, when the case eventually went to trial, uh, something rather strange happened. Uh, the defense attorneys for the police, and they were excellent attorneys, uh, they had the videotape and they had use of force experts who were claiming that all of the force used was justified because the motions made by uh, Rodney King were actually aggressive motions of attack and not just flailing around on the floor trying to get up. Right. And they took the video and they put it into slow motion and, and they were saying this gesture is actually uh, against the officers. Well, in the end, that created sufficient confusion in the minds of the jury uh, to create reasonable doubt and the officers were in fact acquitted of uh, any assault on Rodney King. This caused night after night a riot in Los Angeles. Eventually the federal government kicked in and they arrested the officers for a civil rights violation against Rodney King. Now remember when we spoke about courts and sovereigns, there are 51 sovereigns in, in the United States. Each state is a separate sovereign and the federal government is a separate sovereign. And it is only double jeopardy when the same sovereign tries the person for the same crime. Los, uh, the state of California tried the officers initially, and when he was found not guilty there, the federal government, a different sovereign, came in and put the officers on trial. So it was not double jeopardy. Although many people believe it was uh, improper for the second trial, because the first trial was not a sham trial. It was a legitimate trial with competent and qualified prosecutors who made their case uh, who gave their case and couldn't make it. So many thought that while legally it wasn't double jeopardy, uh, ethically it was double jeopardy. But be that as it may, they had the second federal trial and the officers were convicted. Uh, I suggest you go to YouTube and uh, go to the, a, a Google search, do video, and put Abner Louima in and watch, uh, and watch a little bit of the news coverage. But more importantly, put Rodney King in and watch the tape of the officers uh, affecting the arrest with what uh, a state court said was an excessive force uh, or not beyond a reasonable doubt, and a federal court court said was. So, interesting case. All right, let's go into the changing legal climate. The main source of citizen protection against police abuse of authority are the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution, and you should know this. The first 10 amendments are called the Bill of Rights. Additional protections are contained elsewhere in the Constitution, in other federal laws, in state constitutions, and in state laws. So there are many sources of protections for citizens against government abuse of authority. Now, prior to the 1960s, many police officers routinely violated the rights of citizens. And it was only in the 1960s that court decisions and public pressure began to constrain the police. Note, however, that not all or even most officers abused people's rights prior to the 1960s. But there was a lot of it. Uh, you can have a, a small cadre of really bad officers who can wreak havoc uh, in, in, a, in a neighborhood or a community. Now, the major thrust for protection from police abuse came from the Warren Court in such rulings as Miranda versus Arizona. Now, the war, when you hear the term Warren Court, we're talking about the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, each period of the Supreme Court is named after the Chief Justice, and the Chief Justice during the 1960s was Earl Warren, thus the Warren Court. Today, the Chief Justice's name is Roberts, so it's the Roberts Court. But that's kind of the way that lingo goes. 
Now let's talk about individual rights. The individual civil rights granted to all citizens are enforced by the courts when they decide procedural issues raised by defendants. Remember, we have checks and balances. And in our society, the courts are a check not only on the legislature, stopping them from passing unconstitutional laws, but the courts are also check a check on the executive branch in misusing authority. And police officers are agents of the executive branch. So this is all part of checks and balances. So procedural issues are claims that the police or other government agents violated the Constitution or other laws by using illegal practices to arrest and try the defendant. Now, a procedural violation claim asserts that the police broke the law in making the case against the defendant. Procedural violations by the police or other criminal justice system agents, because it could, it could be a crime lab person, it could be a prosecutor, uh, these violations can result in the exclusion of evidence. So the evidence that was collected illegally is not allowed in court, so it can't be used against the defendant. That's excluding evidence, excluding evidence from court. It can also result in the reversal of convictions. If an appellate court rules that the evidence that was illegally admitted uh, because it was seized illegally uh, or otherwise allowed into the court, to, for the jury to hear illegally uh, was enough to uh, influence the decision and it was a conviction, they can reverse the conviction. Then the prosecutor would have to either drop the case or go back and have a new trial without using that illegal evidence. Not to mention uh, lawsuits against the police and the government. Citizens always have the ability to go to civil court to sue others, including the government, including police officers, if they believe that they have been harmed. And if your constitutional rights are violated, that in and of itself is a serious harm. And if you lost work because you were in jail or your reputation was destroyed, well, that's even more harm. Your family members may have suffered stress and loss of income. Uh, a lot of harm can follow an illegal arrest. All right, let's talk about due process requirements. Now, due process is a requirement guaranteed by the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments that the police respect the rights of the accused throughout the entire process. And by the entire process, I mean from the initial investigation or contact with the, uh, with the defendant, all the way through the arrest process, all the way through the trial, and even to punishment. People have due process rights when they're prisoners in jails and prisons or on probation. Now, the three major due process areas dealt with by the police involve search and seizure, arrest, and interrogation. And we're going to discuss those uh, separately. Let's first talk about search and seizure. The Fourth Amendment protects citizens from unreasonable searches and seizures of their persons, places like homes, uh, and their effects, their possessions. Right. That's what the Fourth Amendment says. Remember, the Fourth Amendment doesn't prohibit searches of people, their places, and their possessions. The Fourth Amendment only prohibits unreasonable searches. And so then the question is, what is an unreasonable search? Well, later on in the Fourth Amendment, they talk about when judges can issue arrest warrants and search warrants. And in that section, they mention that the, uh, there must be probable cause of criminal activity before an arrest or a search warrant can be issued. So probable cause becomes the anchor of, uh, of the legal test of whether a search or seizure is constitutional. The police can only seize you, which is an arrest, search you, search your property, uh, your home, your office, or your possessions, your, your, your handbag, your briefcase, when they have a reasonable cause, probable cause, same thing, to believe that uh, you've committed a crime or there's contraband inside or, or something like that. Uh, so that's the anchor. For, for an arrest or a search, you have to have probable cause. Uh, now, courts have also um, extrapolated from that and said lesser intrusions, like a stop and question, can be done on less knowledge of criminal activity than probable cause. A reasonable suspicion allows a stop in question. Reasonable fear of the person being armed and dangerous permits a frisk. 
Okay, so the Fourth Amendment's protections were a mere facade, and by that I mean a joke, a non-existent, phony, until 1914, when the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the case of Weeks versus Ohio that evidence seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment could not be used in court against the defendant. This exclusion of illegal evidence is called the, and this is a no-brainer, the exclusionary rule, and it puts teeth into the Fourth Amendment. So remember, the Supreme Court has said that if the evidence was seized illegally, it can't be used in the courts. Prior to this, the police could break the law, illegally seize evidence, and they could still use it in the court against the person. That made the pro prohibition against illegal, uh, taking illegal evidence illegally uh, a joke. So only in 1914 was there actually some teeth put into the Fourth Amendment that you couldn't use illegally seized evidence. In addition, four years later in Silver Thorn, uh, Silver Thorn Lumber Company versus the U.S., the Supreme Court ruled that evidence developed from originally and illegally seized evidence is also excluded because it is a fruit of the poisonous tree. Now let me explain this concept a little bit. Um, if I illegally search you and I come up with a... Uh, public locker key. Uh, well, I seized that locker key illegally from you. Now, if I knew you were a drug dealer and I thought you had drugs in that locker and I went to that locker, opened it with, with the key that I illegally took from you uh, and found the drugs, I could not use those drugs in court against you because they are the fruit of a poisonous tree. The poisonous tree was the illegal seizure of the key, which led me to the locker and gave access to the locker. And what I found inside, therefore, is the fruit of a poison tree. So just like the poison tree can't be admitted into evidence, neither can the fruit of the poison tree. That's an important document. Now, in Mapp versus Ohio, the U.S. Supreme Court extended the fruit of the poisonous tree doctrine to the actions of not only federal officers, but also state and local police officers. Remember, uh, up until the 14th Amendment was ratified, and even thereafter for a while, uh, all of the Bill of Rights protections only applied to the actions of federal law enforcement officers, not to those of state and local officers. But in Mapp versus Ohio, the Supreme Court said, hey, uh, it applies also to the illegal searches of local and state officers, not just federal agents uh, in these particular cases. Now, the court used the 14th Amendment to extend the protections of the Constitution to those harmed by the actions of state and local police officers. In the 1980s and 1990s, the Supreme Court decided some other cases which gave the police more latitude in searching and seizing. In addition, the court in 1984 gave, the US, gave in the case of U.S. versus Leon, at uh, a good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. So this good faith exception allows evidence seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment to be admitted into evidence if the police acted on a good faith belief that the search was legal, even if it turns out later to have been illegal due to perhaps no probable cause. So let me explain this. Now, the pendulum went really against the police and all the warrant court decisions and gave a lot of protections and strengthened protections rather to uh, people accused of crimes. But in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of crime and people were upset about it. And the court did some additional cases and they backtracked a little bit. They pulled the pendulum back a little bit more for the police. And one of these is the good faith exception, where if an officer illegally seizes evidence, but it was based on a good faith belief that the office was acting legally, then that evidence can in fact be still admitted. Uh, for example, let's say that uh, a SWAT team is given uh, the address of a location to serve a warrant because uh, an undercover officer had probable cause to believe that it was a drug manufacturing house. And in typing the, the information for the warrant, the, the person uh, who was doing that transposed two numbers in the address. So the warrant actually had the wrong address number. Uh, it was maybe 10 houses down the street. And the SWAT team goes to the wrong house, but lucky for them, they find drugs in that house too. Bad neighborhood, obviously. Uh, 
that those drugs would probably be admissible into court, even though there was no search warrant for that other house, because the officers entered on good faith. They had no idea that there was a transcribed number and it was the wrong address. So that would be an example of good faith. All right, finally, the plain view doctrine. This doctrine allows officers to seize evidence without a warrant, a search warrant, when it is in plain view and the officers are legally in the place they view it from. But police cannot move objects to get plain view. Now, let me explain this. If I have probable cause to believe that there's stolen property, say, maybe 50 stolen TV sets uh, in somebody's house, I can't just go to the house, break in, and seize the property, or even knock on the door and push my way in. Uh, there's no emergency. There's no danger of destruction of evidence. I'm supposed to go to a judge, explain what gave me probable cause. And if the judge agrees, the judge would give me a search warrant, and I could then go back and demand, demand entry into that, that location. Uh, the, uh, so generally, the police need uh, a search warrant. But if the police are legally standing someplace and they see contraband or illegal uh, inside a home or, or what have you, uh, they do not have to get a warrant. They can go in and seize the property. Uh, a prime example would be there's a big party going on in somebody's house. There's a lot of noise. The neighbors call the police for a noise complaint. The officers walk up to the front door, ring the doorbell. And when, the, when one of the party revelers opens the door, Right over that person's shoulder, the police see on a coffee table cocaine and other drugs. The officers are legally standing on the front door, and they see the contraband. They can then walk in and make arrests. And by the way, a little legal tip for you guys. Uh, if you are in a car or if you are in a home and there is contraband in open view, drugs, stolen property, all right, it's in open view and you're there and the police come in legally, they don't just arrest the owner of that house, they can arrest everybody. If contraband is an open view, everybody is presumed to possess it. Uh, so be careful about the parties that you go to. Or if you're driving in a car with shady people and the police pull you over and somebody in the car has drugs and they throw it on the floor and the officer sees the drugs during the stop, he can lock up every or she can lock up everybody in the car. So that's a little quirk in the law that you should be aware of. Now, police officers also do not have to get a warrant before searching when exigent circumstances exist that create a threat to life, a threat of escape, or destruction of evidence. And exigent means emergency circumstances. Um, in addition, they may not have to knock before entering rooms in such situations. Uh, I had such a case. Uh, it was a quiet Sunday and we were uh, hanging out by the police desk when uh, this young man comes in saying that these guys uh, were chasing him and, and they had chains and knives. This sounded like a pretty cool call. So we race down and the kid points like down the block to a group of young people uh, who when they see uh, us start to run. Uh, we gave chase, they ran into a store and they apparently ran out the back door, because when we finally got to the store, we were about a block away, uh, they were not there. However, the store was an illegal betting parlor. It was a bookie joint. Uh, so we arrested uh, the people who were running the illegal betting operation, because that's also against the law. Now, we didn't have a warrant to enter that closed, it was a closed store. We didn't have a warrant to enter that store. Uh, however, it was an exigent circumstance. We were chasing criminals who were trying to escape. Uh, you could also do that if there was a fire. If there was a fire in a small apartment house and, and, and you're going in, knocking on doors, saying, get out, get out, get out, there's a fire. And somebody says, oh, there's a, you know, there's a deaf guy in there. And, and you break the door down, figuring that this deaf person will die in the fire, but, but can't hear the warning. And you see illegal property, you could seize that too. Assuming it doesn't burn up, right? You got to get the property out too. Uh, so that's... Uh, Exigent circumstances. Okay, so that concludes this section of Lesson 5. And uh, now you can go on to the next uh, part of Lesson 5, Lesson 5, Part 2. And I will see you then.